How's everyone doing? So, my name is uh, Jerome Parker. As, uh, as stated, I'm CTO of the Genius Allegiance. We are a uh, back-end consultancy that focuses on you know, doing rapid prototypes. We focus basically on back-end services. So we do WebAssembly modules, we do REST APIs, uh, we do DevOps. So the title of my talk today is Building Scalable Microservice APIs from the Beginning. And we'll go ahead and go forward. So microservice API um, development has been a trend for the last few years. Um, and while it is a very stable uh, topology for building your APIs, it does have some, um, it does have some problems. So microservices are versatile, but that versatility comes at a cost. When traditionally when you're building an application, you're building it with a monolith. You may have an API, but you just, you know, it's, it's a monolithic API and you're consuming it with a front end such as uh, React or Vue.js. When you're running a monolithic API, it's pretty easy to scale because you can just vert horizontally scale it, replicate the server, uh, add some load balancers. It's, it's pretty, pretty standard things that we're used to in the industry. However, when you, are, when you have um, microservices, your scaling has to be both independent and cohesive. And you have to know which uh, parts of your microservice are going to need the most uh, resource allocation for uh, you know, scaling up that specific microservice. Not all your microservices will need to scale up or scale down at the same time. However, the ones that do need to scale Need, you need a means of identifying which individual components to upscale and a method to ensure that they can still integrate with the rest of the system during, before, during, and after scaling. So, as I said, you must scale both independently and cohesively. And in order to do that, you must prioritize your business logic. Um, Scaling is more than, you have the hardware allocation, so you might need to spin up more servers, add more load balancers, et cetera, et cetera. But scaling can also be on the software layer. So we will follow the scalability cube. So, where's the, here we go. On the y-axis, you are scaling by functional decomposition. Merely by writing microservice APIs, you are automatically scaling on the y-axis because a good API architecture is going to follow the Unix philosophy of do one thing and do that one thing very well. And you basically have a system, I, look, I like to look at it like Legos. Each microservice is a Lego, you put them together to build your castle. On the X component, on the X axis, we have horizontal duplication. And this is simply, you know, spinning up more instances, load balancers, et cetera, et cetera. And then on the Z axis, you have data parti partitioning. So this is making sure that your data scales. Each microservice should have its own copy of the data, i.e. sharding your database, making sure that you have eventual consistency on the data layer so you don't have a single point of, um, or you don't have a single point of contention by having a shared database. Your microservices should not share the database. The goal is eventual consistency, and that's where things like Kubernetes uh, come into play. Uh, where we go? So, how do we? So, on the software side, how do we do the functional decomposition, and how do we write these um, systems in a scalable approach? So, the most common design pattern is the gateway design pattern or the edge, uh, edge gateway design pattern. So basically what this is, is you wanna have a single point of entry for your clients that are consuming your API. They don't need to know and probably do not care how many different 
components make up your API and give them the functionality that they need to write their applications. They just want a simple URL. They don't want a whole bunch of, you know, having to do uh, get different keys for, for this service, a different key for this service. They just want one single point of entry. And this is where the gateway comes in. The gateway is, is in itself also a microservice, a microservice whose only job is to call other microservices. So uh, you can either build one yourself or you can deploy an existing solution. I believe Apigee is a platform you can do this on. Um, and you know, there's a whole bunch of other ones as well. Amazon, Google, they have their own. They all pretty much do the same thing, just whatever is the best price for what's your best price for your project. Or you can just build it yourself. I prefer to build it yourself option. So by, have, by using API Gateway, you are reducing latency by having gateway aggregation. Like I said, your client doesn't have to try to reach different uh, machines to get the information that they need. Instead of traditionally having a client talk to point A, point B, point C, point D, point E, you can have your client talk to the gateway. The gateway talks to A, B, C, D, and E without uh, the client needing to know and that reduces latency because you have one single point of entry. Also, gateway, a good uh, gateway design pattern should offer gateway offloading. Enable in individual microservices to offload their shared service functionality to the API gateway level. Basically meaning the uh, microservices that your gateway is going to call needs to be able to um, offload shared functionality. This might mean like, for example, using um, API tokens, OAuth tokens. Um, doing your authentication and authorization on the gateway layer instead of doing it on the individual microservice that you're calling. You're going to offload that functionality so that, you're, so that each microservice can only focus on the business logic that it needs to focus on. And then lastly, you want to have good routing on your API gateway. And your routing needs to be flexible because you do not know how many microservices you might end up having for your application. You might start off with an e-commerce site, you just have a authentication slash authorization, an authentication microservice, an authorization, an authorization microservice, you have your products microservice, and a cart microservice. So you might start off with only four. So you're just gonna hard code those four in. Next thing you know, you're gonna offer a coupons um, microservice. Not a big deal, you're at five, you're just gonna hard code that in. Next thing you know, you're gonna, uh, you know, hopefully you'll be at a level of Amazon, you got hundreds of microservices. You're not gonna wanna hard code all those in. What you would wanna do is have a routing mechanism that uses service injection, or um, service discovery, some sort of schema, JSON, what have you, what doesn't really, oh, what happened there? doesn't really matter, but there we go. But you wanna have, um, you wanna have routing. Um, you, wanna have, you wanna have a means where you can auto discover your new services you're gonna add, and then the gateway is basically gonna call, do the routing, usually using HTTP requests to um, call your different, your different microservices. But you don't wanna hard code it, it needs to be scalable. Your microservices are gonna need a way to communicate with each other when events happen. Um, I mean, you guys just heard the last talk, so, you know, to, for the sake of brevity, uh, pub subsystems are, are a much needed, wet, much needed system in a microservice architecture. Typically, you're gonna, uh, you're gonna have, you're gonna have a messaging layer, you can use RabbitMQ, you can use Solace, you can use I don't care, whatever is, whatever is gonna give you the most bang for your buck for your project. But uh, your microservices, like I said, need to focus just on their individual business logic. So all the logic needed for communication should be offloaded to some sort of pub sub system. Um, and that's pretty much it on that side. Service mesh. So a lot of people I see when I uh, read articles or I go on YouTube, they talk about API gateway versus service mesh. 
And that really bothers me because they are uh, not competing systems. They actually should and can be used together. So a service mesh provides a, help, a helper infrastructure for inner service communication, okay? So a good service mesh will offer things like resiliency, such as fault tolerance, load balancing, service discovery, routing, observability, security, access control, communication protocol support, et cetera, et cetera. Instances are typically deployed alongside each microservice. So each microservice is gonna have its own service mesh. Uh, ideally in the same container if you're using Docker, et cetera, et cetera. And they communicate through primitive network functions of that service. So, you know, um, sockets, um, uh, whatever protocol that that microservice is using, HTTP, it doesn't matter. So you're gonna, it's good to decouple, it's good because it decouples network communication functions from the actual microservice code, and I will keep beating this horse. Your microservice code, the actual code in your microservice should only be focused on your business logic. Should not be focused on messaging, should not be focused on um, uh, access control, unless that's its primary thing. Um, it shouldn't be focusing on routing, et cetera, et cetera. It should just be focused on whatever that business logic is for that microservice. Leave all the network communication up to the service mesh. So you'll have your API layer, and then alongside each microservice, you're gonna have a service mesh, your, your uh, I'm upset, your API gateway, and then your gateway talks to each service. Each service is also gonna have a service mesh that does all its, um, inner service communication. And each thing has just its each one own specific task. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. All right. So what are some best practices, some more best practices when it comes to um, API, microservice API infrastructure? So as I said earlier, you wanna have decentralized data management. One thing I see a lot of people do, a lot of teams do, is that they're really good at the concept of having microservices, but they are sharing the same database. And um, when you go at scale, that's gonna be a problem because you don't wanna have all those reads and writes you know, going in from different areas. You can obviously see, understand and see how that will create bottlenecks and uh, create a point of failure for your architecture. So what you wanna do is you wanna, um, you wanna have a system in place that is gonna replicate your data. And, it, can't, and it's, it cannot be instant, so the goal you're looking for is eventual consistency. Um, which is something, like I said, um, Kubernetes is, is pretty good at, making sure that your, all your containers and stuff eventually are consistent. Um, not, and then also each data system, each, you know, let's say we're replicating a MySQL database across uh, your different microservices. Now all those microservices are gonna need to be uh, read and write. Some of them need to just be read. Reads are faster than writes. Uh, can't remember what the magnitude of is, but reads are definitely faster than writes. If you're caring about things such as latency, you're gonna have to make decisions such as that. Is this data based on, on, the, um, um, on the coupons microservice that we just put up? We just need to read the coupons. We have, a, we have another service that's, um, that's creating the coupons from an XML document or something. I'm, I'm coming up with this top of my head. So you know, we don't care about rights. We have another system that, that actually writes the data. We just need it to read. So we'll make stuff like that. Smart endpoints and dumb pipes. Each service owns a well-defined API for external communication. Avoid leaking implementation details <clears throat> of that microservice. So, what does this mean? Um, basically, your each each endpoint um, should be kind of it should be well defined on how it speaks outside of outside of itself to other microservices, to other third party, um, other third party services or whatever. But 
you know, it should you shouldn't it shouldn't be open about how that implementation works. It kind of should be agnostic because you might you might change how you're doing this um, you might change how you're doing your external communication later. So don't um, don't make it agnostic. Make it agnostic. Thanks for the point. Ignore that. Avoid coupling between services. This is something that is um, easy to say, but hard to do in practice. But obviously, the whole one of the benefits of having a microservice is that if one microservice goes down, your whole application won't go down. So in order to achieve that goal, you have to make sure that your microservices don't, uh, don't, are not tightly coupled to other microservices because if they are and one goes down, now you have two that are down. And then if you have another one that's tied to that one, now you have three that went down when it could have just been one, which makes debugging obviously harder because where do you start in terms of, um, in terms of you know, finding the, finding the bug? Decentralized development, which is personally my favorite thing to talk about. Avoid sharing your code bases, your data schemas, your, and your development team members among multiple services and projects. Microservices are called micro for a reason. They should be written very quickly. So therefore, from a business perspective, uh, it, you should be able to justify the cost of having multiple teams working at the same time to get your microservices done. Whenever you have multiple, the same, uh, whenever you have the same team working on multiple projects, what happens? You have over, you, 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 can't, you can't do two things at once. I know we like to think that we, we can multitask, but we can't. And what ends up happening is when you're talking, when you wanna focus on a certain microservice and you're working on another microservice, you start thinking about how you can optimize both of them and get them to work together at the same time and nothing ends up getting done. So have your team, I always say that your team shouldn't be no more than two people, one senior engineer, one mid-junior engineer. Let them create that microservice. If they finish that microservice, great, put them on a new microservice, but don't have them working on it at the same time. Have your Trello board or Jira board or however you do your project management and tracking and um, you know, have your teams of twos go knock it out. So we got about two minutes, all right. Keep domain knowledge out of the gateway. Let the gateway handle routing and cross-cutting concerns. So don't, so this kind of goes back to, you know, don't hard code your logic. Your gateway should be, agno should be domain, ag domain agnostic, meaning if you need to change domains, it should be able to swiftly um, adapt and change with that domain. Um, let, let, like I said, like it says, let the domain handle routing and cross-cutting concerns. Try to make that pretty succinct. Uh, best practices, token-based authentication. This is like what I said earlier. Um, so if you're using OAuth 2 or, or OpenID, you're having the token go to the API layer, authenticate there, and then once you're authenticated and authorized, you don't have to re, uh, re-authorize, re-authenticate when you're doing the separate microservices that the API gateway is calling. Uh, Event-driven nature, um, you know, piggybacking off the last talk, so uh, you, you, want your, you want your services to be able to communicate asynchronously. Um, the best way to do this is with you know, some sort of messaging queue system. Uh, eventual consistency, making sure that your DevOps infrastructure is set up in a way that your um, data is replicated, um, your states can be replicated, et cetera, et cetera. And fault tolerance. So, uh, when you're designing your systems, you know, the, you can do things like designing the circuit breaker pattern uh, because uh, we may, you know, we may need to use a call another microservice when the, within a microservice. And if that microservice goes down, you know, if we do things like using the circuit breaker pattern, uh, we won't be hung up if something is, is down. So, and then also, and, and let the application keep flowing so it goes back to the original concept of microservice being independent and maintainable. 
deployment options. So when you're deploying your microservices, you know, you basically have four different options. You can run the containers, uh, so the whole Docker thing, that's good for enforcing DevOps objectives, rapid development, reduce time to market, seamless scaling. You have the cloud deployment option, which is good for building reliable and scalable infrastructure to serve geographically dispersed users. You can go with the serverless option, which is good for handling highly volatile traffic, or you can maintain your own IT infrastructure. This is really only plausible if you have the capital and resources to um, build and maintain that infrastructure. But um, at that point, you know, you're, you're not bound by, by pretty much anything. So we're gonna take some questions in this last four and a half minutes, but before I do, if everyone is on Twitter, you can go ahead and follow me at twitter.com slash mastershake08. I also have a personal uh, blog and a YouTube page, jeromeparker.com and youtube.com slash c slash jeromeparker, where I talk about code and DevOps and um, you know just computer science in general. So this is my talk and um, any questions? Okay, um, so I'm gonna touch on the uh, quick question about API gateways and event-driven um, API. So I noticed that they're usually discussed separately, right? So you'll, you'll talk about the AP, API gateway and how it manages REST pretty well, and then talk about event-driven architecture next. I'm wondering why we usually separate them out, and in the future, can we head towards a place where API gateways do handle event-driven architecture? Okay, so great question. Um, the reason why they are separated, in my opinion now, like I, I, everyone might have a different opinion. So like I said, um, the whole thing about microservices that kind of follow like the Unix architecture, do one thing and do that one thing well. So that even goes into talks of planning, when you're planning your, your, your um, architecture and your structure. So the API gateway should just do the API gateway. You know, um, the, the queuing system, the messaging system should just do the messaging system. Now, I do think when you're in talk, when you're doing, when you're doing like architectural talks, and planning talks, when you're uh, sprint talks and stuff like that, yeah, um, there should be more, you know, talking and uh, communication and transparency there. But in terms of the technicals, uh, no, they should, they, they, they should probably just stick to what they're doing and do that one thing well. Because another thing is it makes it good, easy to swap it out. Let's say you want to use um, RabbitMQ um, as your event system, and RabbitMQ isn't doing it well for you. You need to um, you need to go up to Solace for enterprise level, um, you know, in your enterprise level needs. You know, if you have them tightly coupled together to your API gateway, you may not be able to do that or you may be able to do it at the cost of, you know, time that could have been spent, you know, developing and maintaining your architecture. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Awesome. More questions? Thank you. <coughs> so in your earlier slide about um, design pattern for the gateway, you mentioned uh, offloading, right? Like uh, certain things you can offload to the gateway. One of them was token generation. Mm -hmm. By doing so, are you saying that the backend API that are written in microservices don't have to go through those authorization? Correct, correct. And, and if so, how would you protect those backend APIs with just instead of keeping it open? So, okay, so you're asking how to put, so there's a couple of different ways, you know, one of them being like, for example, uh, locking down the API so only the IP address of the gateway can even, you know, access that, you know, and talk to that microservice. Um, and so, you know, if you do your authentication your off and your authorization on the gateway layer um, at the top, you already know what you're authorized to talk to, who you're authorized to talk to, whatnot, and, that mach and only that machine is able to even call the other microservices anyway because you locked it down on the network layer. So that's one way of doing it. 
And the reason why you would want to do that is because you're, that reduces latency. Because um, when you, your network calls might call multiple, you might call four or five microservices in one call. So if you're gonna have to do authentication authorization every time for each one, and you're having millions of users, you know, what's that latency looking like? Even if, even if it's only, you know, a quarter of a second, but at scale, that, that's, that's entropy, that's just entropy for no reason. When you can offload that in the beginning, and if you, and you know, design it right, you know, you're doing a uh, good test driven design, you uh, checking all your, um, your edge cases and stuff like that, you're gonna be good. And you're safe, and that, and, and that, that saved latency, that, um, that lower latency, um, from a business perspective, uh, directly translates to more revenue. So. Thank you, Jerome. Thank you.